Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. And great to have back my friend Rick Gates. Rick, how are you doing? Great, Zenny. Good to be with you again. Good to yeah. see you. Great to see you too, man. Definitely, yeah. I can think of no other person, and I'll explain candidly why, to ask about the resignation of Andrew Cuomo. And the reason is that, and you can talk and about I'll explain that. candidly why. Oh, that's my To echo. ask about the resignation of Andrew Cuomo. And the reason is that, is that it's my perception that the Democratic, that my party, you're Republican, my party has a tendency to take itself out because we're taking out Democrats. It's like, who do we aim at next? And if I'm looking at it the wrong way, so be it. But I, I just look at this row of people that have been taken out, if not by allegations, then by you know, sh younger progressives shooting at them. And look, I have nothing against anybody. I'm just talking about the process of where I feel like good leaders are being taken out or where they're good leaders at all. Talk me down from the ledge. Well, I think your last point, whether they're good leaders, is the optimal question, right? Because this is this is not about political party. It's not about Republican or Democrat. This is about a person as an individual and the choices that they make and the judgment uh, that they display. And so I think whether this has been a Republican or a Democrat, based on the allegations, based on the actions uh, and the number of witnesses that have come forward, that person just has to step down. You're, cre you know, in politics, we always say, like, you don't want to become you know, the issue, if you become the issue, then you need to step aside for the greater good of the people. And mm -hmm. again, that's why I say this is, this is you know, breaks the barrier uh, between Republicans and Democrats, has nothing to do with that. This is more about Andrew Cuomo as an individual, uh, just as it could be, you know, Gavin Newsom, or it could be DeSantis, or anybody out there, that if you get into situations like this, that create issues that don't help the people that you're governing, that you're leading, then it's time to step aside and let somebody come in and be able to do that so that the people benefit from it. I mean, th this is this is where, you know, I think a lot of the politicians, they crave and they, they can't let go of the power. And it creates a situation like this where it just results in bad judgment, bad decisions. Uh, and it's time to go. When do you think or was the moment where he maybe went too far, uh, talking about Andrew Cuomo, and didn't see the writing on the wall. Was this something that was always out there that we just didn't want to see? What would, what it would, what, here's, and again, this is the talk me down from the ledge issue. Um, he had his closest aides essentially close in on him. Mm -hmm. That's what it looks like to me. And some people think, well, they were manipulated and all that, but something happened to make them stop. Do you think that they talked to him and said, hey, don't do this and you just didn't listen? What, what, was, what, what am I missing here? You know, I think people have a tendency, especially, you know, where he is in his life, that they uh, ego, uh, experience, how much they've been in office, uh, the comfortability factor that they have, um, that they tend not to listen to people. Um, you know, Donald Trump didn't listen to a lot of us and he had very good instincts, so he's probably right to do so. Uh, but, you know, you have Andrew Cuomo, you have others out there that kind of like to chart their own course. They think they're there because they've gotten there uh, on their own accord. And so I don't think there were a lot of aides that were able to really talk him down. Um, what I think you have is a series of events that kind of compounded. Um, you know, for me in this whole, you know, exercise of Andrew Cuomo, the piece that continually kind of gets pushed aside, uh, and I think that's more relevant, is, is the nursing home, you know, situation yeah, and the number right. of deaths. That created. I mean, I understand it's the sexual harassment that you know ultimately created uh, you know his his um, movement to resign. But th that, as important as it is it, for me, it wasn't as important as the nursing home scandal. So I was more concerned about that. But those two compounded, I think, resulted in him ultimately resigning, which I think all of us knew it was going to happen. Um, it was just a matter of when. Was there a future for Cuomo? I, I don't think so. Maybe, you know, he, he could, you know, do a show with Elliot Spitzer down the road or something like that. <laughs> what about Chris Cuomo? Because he took time off and I, I personally don't, I mean, how do I say this? I'll just say it. I don't see where he blame, he should get so much of the blame. I think he should have just came out there and talked about, you know, his role, if anything, and just not as opposed to this hiding thing. Am I am I wrong? 
Absolutely not. You you are, and if anybody could give Chris Cuomo advice, that would have been just be transparent. I mean, even people like Tucker Carlson say, hey, look, I understand you're defending your brother. Any of us that had brothers or family in a situation like that would have done the same. But be transparent about it, be upfront. Don't try to dodge the issue. Don't say you're going on vacation. And certainly if you're gonna sit there and help advise him and get classified or sensitive information uh, you know, from his operation, then just be upfront about it. That's what the American people were looking for. And this whole, you know, dance routine that he's doing and, and, and now taking vacation, it's just further, you know, putting him in a ditch. Yeah, it seems like by doing it, he actually has something to hide. Well, he does. I mean, he, he's hit, well, up to this point, he's hidden the fact that how involved he was. What we've learned from the investigator's report is that he was much more intimately involved than he or CNN led anybody to believe. And that's where the dishonesty not only hurts the network, but it hurts him as an individual and it hurts his show because nobody's going to believe that he has any credibility or transparency whatsoever. Are you saying that CNN might terminate him? Look, I think it's always been an option. I mean, if you looked at, uh, there was even before this incident, like his ratings were, do, were doing pretty poorly. Mm -hmm. um, and they had uh, considered a, a number of cuts, a number of changes. Um, so this may be the impetus that finally gets them there. You know, sometimes it's always interesting, right? Vacations often tend to turn into longer vacations, uh, depending on which way it might go. But you hit on something that that my, that my pea brain completely missed. If he were so valuable to CNN from a ratings perspective, or as we now say, a streaming perspective, they would not, he would not be on vacation. He would still be working because he's too valuable to lose, right? Well, and that, and look, he had an opportunity. He could have actually gained a lot of credibility by actually covering what was going on with his brother if he had chosen to do so. If he were willing to come out and report the facts, uh, both sides of the situation, both sides of the story, I think a lot of people would have said, hey, you know what, I respect him for that. Uh, but in, in instead, he, he went the other direction and tried to hide it. And, and it's one thing if you're a private citizen doing that. It's another thing if you're an on-air journalist. And it's certainly uh, another thing if you're saying you're a journalist and you're not a pundit, which he really is. Right, right, absolutely. And you pointed to something too, just in that comment that I sort of forgot in that, you know, when times were good, if you will, he covered his brother. Yes. Absolutely. Now times are bad and he's invisible. Yeah. Remember, he's like not remember, there. The, remember he's, the run up to the vice president, you know, Cuomo was one of the potential VP candidates, you know, early on. Remember that? I mean, I sure the book, yeah, everything was going, you know, in the upward trajectory for uh, Andrew Cuomo. Yeah, and Chris was right there to have him on, you know, have great banter with them, you know, give them the kind of insights to how they relate as a family. And then, whew, man, making it seem to me that it's actually going to get worse before it even gets better because of these actions. You know, I guess there are actions that you can take that, let me put it this way. If you were the political consultant to the Cuomos, who would you tell them? I think right now, I think resigning was the right thing to do. I think uh, he should have done it sooner. I think he shouldn't have allowed a 14 day. I mean, what's interesting in this whole scenario now, it's not Republicans that are coming out and disparaging Cuomo, it's Democrats. Uh, you know, former Governor uh, David Patterson just recently came out and said, look, I don't know why he's taking two weeks. Uh, he should be out of office now. He should have resigned, maybe give him a day or two. But why is it two weeks? What is what else is going to happen? So there's kind of this, as I was reading all the articles and, and, and watching the commentary on it, I think there's more to come. I think the uh, AG Attorney General's report was very interesting. It, it led down some, some paths that I don't think a lot of people had considered earlier and certainly led to a lot of new information that uh, had not been disclosed. So as, as anybody in a situation like that, there all, there's always more there than, than people see. I think it's a question of how much it comes out. Um, but, you know, in addition to it, you know, what I would tell them as an advisor is just be transparent. You know, most of these guys get caught in the cover up, not the actual act. And that's exactly what seems to have happened here. And, and interestingly, I wonder if you go back and kind of, you know, read between the lines, but if it hadn't been for some of his decisions on COVID, whether or not a lot of this, you know, would have escalated to the level it is today, because there was a period where a lot of people thought he actually might have had this beat. If it wasn't, you know, remember up until the AG's report, everybody, you know, on both sides of the aisle kind of went silent for the most part. They were just waiting to see uh, what might come down the road. And once the report came out, and because it was a Democratic administration, a Democratic attorney general, 
uh, and some other uh, individuals that are looking at criminal charges now, that was all on his side of the aisle. And it was amazing to see how quickly they all distanced themselves from him. The criminal charges matter. Do you think that'll stick? Because it sounds like it just came up uh, listening to his aide talk on, I think it was CBS this morning, but uh, or his former aide, I should say. But it sounded like it was done because this person didn't think that he got it or something like that. That was the reason I thought I heard. I think there are a couple of reasons that why it was pushing forward. First and foremost, it was to remove him. If, if he's not, and remember, he was very defiant when the AG's report first came out, and it looked like he wasn't going to resign. He was clearly going to fight it all the way. And I think as an additional pr pressure, and uh, you know, obviously uh, looking how our, our justice system you know, doesn't work a lot of the time, uh, the tactics that these prosecutors use, that's a very common one. And so you just keep leveling pressure as much as you can until you hit somebody's breaking point. And criminal charges obviously have a lot more impact than the civil charges. I mean, his reputation is one thing. Can he overcome that? Maybe over time, depends what he does and how he does it and how transparent he is. But with the criminal stuff, that takes it to a completely new level. My sense is, and I, I just knowing that the justice system doesn't work, I suspect he'll you know cut some sort of deal, you know, as part of this resignation that uh, you know he'll resign, he'll do you know cooperate, and then they'll drop the criminal piece and maybe these individual witnesses. Uh, can pursue the uh, civil uh, charges, which I think will still stand. Yeah, because it makes me ask, well, how many judges is he going to see that maybe he had some influence over getting to their positions anyway, right? Well, that was part of you know, kind of Pandora's box as I was going back and, and doing some of the research. Um, remember, uh, you know, Governor Cuomo and Pret Bahara, the former U.S. Attorney General for uh, U.S. Attorney for the Southern District, had a very uh, negative relationship, and uh, this was being. You remember that? And so so now Prep Bahar has come back into the picture and uh, there seems to be stuff in the AG's report alluding to how uh, Andrew Cuomo specifically tried to remove uh, a, a U.S. attorney, which obviously would have been, you know, interference in our judicial system from uh, an executive branch position. So a lot more to come, I think. Wow. This is going to get, uh, for him, worse before it gets better, it seems. Always but does. Yes. Honestly, Absolutely right. What's the GOP view on this? Are you guys just looking at this and going, <laughs> or, you know, with this, with it, there's opportunity in chaos, right? Yes. And look, I, I think uh, it's a great question because both sides of the aisle uh, have these opportunities. And, and when, when I was working on President Trump's campaign, we had a lot of those same opportunities when a lot of the, you know, John Podesta and Donna Brazil emails came out. And that's a great question, right? What do you do? Do you, do you kind of run with it? Do you push it, promote it? And, and politics has gotten to a point where our voters are pretty uh, sophisticated from a standpoint that if somebody's trying to push negative material on another person, they really don't like that, you know? And, and so in our instance, in, 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 during the Trump campaign, we let the Democrats, you know, kind of run with it because they were always on the defensive. And, and when you're in a position of attacking on policy issues and somebody else is having to defend on a personal issue, that's a great situation to be in from a political camp point of view. So, so I don't, I don't think the Republicans are really going to push this. In fact, because it's New York, um, other than you know people at the federal level down in Congress that might say something, it doesn't really uh, resonate for them. You know, it's not a federal issue; it's a state of New York. So the guys, if any Republicans that I would suspect to come out, are obviously going to be the ones on uh, the gubernatorial side, uh, Mr. Zeldin, you know, Mr. Giuliani, others that are running in that race. Uh, but from what I've seen, they've played it very, you know, uh, smartly and they have not, uh, you, know, you know, done anything with that issue. Let the Democrats defend it. And what you're seeing is exactly what I alluded to. You're having Democrats come out and criticize Cuomo better than any Republican could do. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's like we, we, we seem to be great at eating ourselves. And we are, too. Don't, it, it doesn't go one way. It goes both ways. Okay. I'm, I, I'm, I'm somewhat relieved. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm. I'm not sure. I'm entirely relieved because the, the situation of people eating each other is not exactly a pleasant one to watch, let alone be part of. But uh, it, Kathy Hockel, yes, her performance yesterday. Your thoughts? I thought overall. Look, it was interesting. She's had time to really prepare. This this scandal has been going on for quite some time. She's had a number of issues that she's had to deal with in terms of his uh, Andrew Cuomo's sexual harassment, uh, the COVID situation with the nursing homes, uh, you know, the, the crime commission coming in early on in his administration. So she has, it's not like she's taking over uh, tomorrow and she had no time to prepare. 
So I think what will be interesting is to watch what vision she charts for New Yorkers. Obviously, this is not a great position to be in as a lieutenant governor um, because you're dealt with a lot of, of tough baggage uh, that she's got to overcome, most specifically COVID, school, school kids, and the economy. And that's not a great position to be in right now, particularly what's, what's going on with the trends around the rest of the country. So I think the best thing that she can do is come in, move beyond the scandal as quickly as possible and show her true leadership ability if she has. I mean, we'll know pretty quickly if she's a good leader or not. And if she's able to kind of bring New York and rally New York back together, um, she might have a decent shot, you know, at, uh, at running for governor herself if she chooses to do so. What's interesting about the whole Andrew Cuomo situation, I'm sure you picked up on it as well, is it wasn't necessarily that it was just about Cuomo, but it was about all the people involved in the investigation, the report, in politics that wanted to see Cuomo go to pay the path for their potential rise mm -hmm. to power. Uh, Letitia James, as an example, she's clearly going to run. She had a great opportunity to take Cuomo out. Um, I think to your point, eating your own is a fascinating concept for the Democrats at this point in the state of New York, because normally a Democrat would come to the aid or support somebody in that position. And the fact that so many Democrats turned on him so quickly, you know, for me as, as, as kind of a, a, a political student, told me that he's either had a lot of enemies, uh, he's abused a lot of people over the years, not physically, but just, you know, in terms of his position of power and, and on policy issues. Uh, and certainly that he's made uh, in the course of that time, uh, people that want to come after him and take him out. And again, there was very little support coming to him in this entire crisis. And that's what gets to my other question is regarding the, the rub between the progressives and the traditionalists in the Democratic Party, how it's playing out. How much of that is part of this as well? Well, I think from a policy point of view, it's going to play out a lot heavier than maybe necessarily the Andrew Cuomo specific situation. I mean, if you kind of step back and look at it, you got Andrew Cuomo, two term governor, was probably going to run for a third term. And he's, you know, had a lot of experience. He comments about how a lot of this is generational. But then to your point, you have a group of progressives that has come up and, you know, in essence, they created the Me Too movement. They created a lot of very kind of controversial policy positions that they're kind of pushing onto the Democratic Party, which the Democratic Party is pushing back on. And it's gonna be interesting, you know, as a great example, the infrastructure bill that was recently passed by Congress, uh, amazing that to think that the Senate and for all the focus on the Senate that it wasn't gonna go through and it did pass with a group of bipartisan Republican uh, senators. But now to your point, the progressives in Congress, AOC, to leave all the others are saying they're going to vote against it. And it would be absolutely <laughs> astonishing if this bill dies with the Democratic House. That's what fe fears me, because, for example, the bill has a provision in it that really benefits the Bay Area in California regarding sea level rise, which is an enormous problem in East Oakland. That would give us enough money to fix the problem. But if they kill the bill, that's the quintessential example of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, you know? Exactly. And that's what bothers about the direction of my party. Um, Not just the party. I think the country is any. I think this goes beyond because the Republicans are as apt to do this type of act as, as, as the Democrats. And for me, what it shows is that we can't rely on politicians in Washington to fix our problems in the state of California for you or Virginia for me. We've got to find better leaders and, and, and more localized leadership that can tackle some of these hard issues. Some of the issues you guys are facing in California I don't even know about in Virginia because we're not facing them and vice versa. So I think the more that we tend to rely on Congress, the worse we are. And look, I was looking it up the other day because I, I always like to see how low Congress's approval rating can go, no matter who's <laughs> over. It's usually the lowest uh, of, of the group out of the president, vice president, former presidents. Um, it just always amuses me that people in this country are tuned into how bad Congress is. And that's just a greater uh, issue of, of the American people coming together. And from my standpoint, being through a lot of this is saying enough with these politicians, enough with these people that come to Washington and want to self-serve and want to hold on to their position of power and lose sight of some of the issues that actually need to get done. What politician is going to be against infrastructure, right? China is killing us all over the world on infrastructure. Not only are they helping their own country build great infrastructure, they're out into multiple other countries building infrastructure. They're in Africa and South America. They're all over the map. And, and what are we doing here? We're fighting and bickering over things that have nothing to do with infrastructure that are part of the infrastructure bill. And as a result, the politics is going to prevent us from moving forward and progressing as a country as a whole. Yeah. And a major, major bad timing 
at that. Say, uh, in the time that we have remaining, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the recall election because my longtime uh, buddy, and I won't say that candidly, I, you know, I've known him since 1998, and uh, he's a great guy, Gavin Newsom. Uh, we go back to when he owned the Balboa Back Cafe. Uh, there's a lot of stories when he was married to Kim, you know, and they used to send me Christmas cards. So I have a, a full disclosure, you know, personal stake in um, seeing my friend excel. He has a, I told him years ago, I said, you know, the probably the best thing that should ha happen to you is an industrial accident. <laughs> mess up his face, right? So, <laughs> that way, <laughs> he probably looked at you with, well, "What are you talking about, Zach?" <laughs> he got what I was saying. It was, <laughs> um, but okay, does he survive the recall? So I actually think he probably does, uh, and it's not so much because of him, but because of the actual situation. Look at the slate of candidates that you guys have running, and it's <clears throat> very hard to in a recall effort to have one person unless there's some effort or agreement before the election takes place that everybody kind of pools together at the last minute on the one candidate that looks like they're leading in order to have a chance. The interesting thing about what's going on in California is that there are enough people that clearly want to see Newsom go. But when you get to a situation like this, voters are very hesitant to create upheaval. There's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of unknown. And I noticed Gavin Newsom is really kind of trying to turn different corners to uh, obviously you know, enhance his reputation and his perception um, as we get closer to that election date. But the real question is, is are the other slate of candidates, because there's so many, and that's really what draws people away, uh, it, it's gonna probably create a scenario where Gavin is able to come out and probably just squeak by uh, you know, with enough votes. But again, the real question for you, I mean, given the face that 2020 and the uh, historical voter turnout, you're obviously not going to have that in the recall. So what a lot of pollsters, I'm sure out in California right now are trying to do is model how many people are going to come out. What is the expected voter turnout? Because that'll help them quickly put into perspective whether Newsom will survive. I suspect he will just again because of the situation, not because of him as an individual. Yeah, I think what Gavin has going for him is there's no Arnold Schwarzenegger. Because I was, you know, I was around and actually voted for Schwarzenegger uh, at the time. And I'll tell you why. Uh, I felt that, and I don't feel this for the party then, but I felt our party had lost its touch with respect to what the people wanted. Yes. And we needed, we needed to be, um, we needed to be uh, put on a course correction. And uh, that's exactly, I think, what happened. This time, I don't think that's the case. Um, because I don't see anybody on the other side has any government experience or understanding of policy. Uh, well, nothing your point, hurt. California needs a course correction, but the question is, are the people of California identifying with anybody that they can actually think, you know, does that? And I don't think they've come to that solution yet. That's the issue. Schwarzenegger, you're right. Everybody's like, you gotta give Arnold a shot. I mean, how, how much worse could it be? Yeah, and he was good. And he was you good, know? right, exactly. Yeah, I, I, I voted for him twice and I'm a Democrat, I'm registered. I have no problem saying that. And I'll tell you, uh, I'll tell you what made me do it. I said it before when I was on KQED Forum years ago, and I'll say it again. I was at a fundraiser for uh, a friend of mine who's running for district attorney named Kamala Harris. And John Burton walks by me. Uh, he was our state senator. I never met the guy, okay? Never saw him before in person, Rick. He, I said, Senator, how are you? He said, F off. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I went. What? That's a good way to gain a vote. Yeah, I'm thinking. Apparently, he's known for this, right? I'm thinking. I don't care. So I just, I, I mean, the guy has not that I'm like, Mister. I'm not, you know, I'm anchorman or something. Like, do you know I'm a big deal or anything like that? No, but you know, I was able to get on KQED form and say what happened and say, hey, look, here's why I'm voting for Arnold, and I did, and I said it. Um, it's that that mentality when people do that. You know, they think they're untouchable, that they can say anything to you like that. That's when, in my opinion, it was time for him to go. It was time for the party to have a have a course correction. That's personally why I did it. Did it have to do with any major policy issue? No. But, you know, I think you'll agree with this. But when the rubber meets the road of politics, it's about people and relationships, right? Absolutely. 
It's about it's about people being able to can candidates being able to connect with the people and the people believing them. And, and to that point and at a much higher level, though, this is why I'm so excited to, as we move forward in, in this country to hopefully see people that never thought they could run for office now run for office. You don't need to be a 30 year politician. You don't need to have a legal degree. You can, I mean, you can be anybody and everybody and actually run for an elected office. And, and we need to get away from this idea that politics is a, uh, a professional occupation. I mean, you look at most of the states, I think, you know, I don't know about California per se, but Virginia and a lot of the East Coast states, they were citizen legislatures. So their primary job was not to be a representative. Their primary job is whatever they did every day, whether it was a farmer or a lawyer or an accountant. And we've gotten away from that. We have professional politicians that, you know, kind of embrace this power and then don't want to let it go at the federal and state levels. And so the people just, they, they, they feel like they can't do anything about it. And so I'm hopeful that, that more and more, particularly as, as you say, whether it's progressives on the left side or, you know, radical Republicans on the right side, at least if they're pushing uh, their ideas and ideologies and people that aren't necessarily politicians to run for office, I think ultimately it's going to be a good thing. I agree with you. Absolutely. Hey, how do they contact you as a consultant? <laughs> you, you have my contact information. I'm on Twitter. You can uh, email me. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, we're, we're doing a lot in, in camp, different campaigns uh, across the country, but a lot with election integrity, too. And I think that's going to be an important issue uh, moving forward in, in every state as a, in, in our country as uh, other countries are looking at us and, and compare us as the model democracy, because we, we've got a lot of work to do to repair those those images. I, I can't agree more. Hey, uh, sticking to my time limit. Uh, thank you so very much. Aren't you surprised I'm sticking to my time limit? You got very good. I was going to say, you're quite, wow. Wow. You're crisp and sharp and uh, I love it. It's great. It's called no eggs. A good discussion, a lot of content. Um, and, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that tend to ramble a lot about, you know, uh, nothing. And it's great to be able to focus it and bring uh, your listeners something that they can, you know, actually learn from. And that's my whole goal is, is, is not to persuade one way or the other, but it's just to like share experiences and to bring different perspectives to people so that, you know, maybe they thought about, you know, something one way and now they have a different perspective about it. Um, but it's up to them to come to that conclusion. And you're masterful at that. Hey, I stick Back I'm learning. Back. I'm learning from others as well. It's it's a great experience. I, I absolutely. Hey, folks. Hey, stick around in the background, Rick. Thanks, everybody. And uh, NFL football. Here we come. Later. We'll talk to you later. See ya. Subscribe to Zenny Sixty Two and bookmark Oka News Now.